uh, I have uh, about 16 years in the language services <coughs> industry. Uh, I worked in hospitals, I worked in conferences, and I currently do lots of cultural advocacy work with the State Department as an artist. I'm also a musician and a clinician. And uh, languages is a very important part of my life. It is probably the fabric that kind of connects all the different interests that I have together. And so do you want me to go straight into some talking points or do you want me to just- oh, Sure, sure, go okay. ahead. Okay, well, this particular topic is interesting to me because currently I'm a PhD candidate at the Universidad de Alcalá, focusing on translation and cultural competency and how it affects the accuracy. Right now, because we're in a very specific, a very unique time, I should say, in world history where the concept of inclusion and the voice of what many call the subaltern <clears throat> is starting to become a, a, a favorite topic of the media, for lack of a, a better a way to explain that. Having interpreters and translators in all spaces, uh, in the diplomatic space, as well as in the pop culture space, who are culturally competent, is extremely important. I have lots of examples that I could give you from my research, but um, one that I would like to start with is Black Lives Matter. I have a dear friend who is a music journalist, <clears throat> excuse me, and the translator of um, English to Japanese. And her passion is African-American culture, African-American music. And because of this, she has been tasked to translate the autobiographies of multiple African-American musical luminaries, such as George Clinton um, and, and the like. But when Black Lives Matter became an international slogan, headline movement, she was unsure how to translate that phrase because she saw that it was such a source of contention and um, intense dialogue in the American public and internationally. She didn't want to phrase it in a way that would be offensive or be misleading to the Japanese reading public. So she, in her wisdom as a linguist, she called me and asked <clears throat> how I felt about giving her some insight as to what it meant. And I said, of course, we've, we've been friends for a very long time, but um, beyond that, I, I highly respect her work as a journalist. So um, I received a list of questions from her so she could kind of dig deeper beyond the surface word for word understanding of the phrase and getting more of an ideological framework for what the implications of the phrase meant. So I'm just gonna to read to you some of the questions she sent me just to kind of give the audience an idea as to how being open-minded and realizing that, of course, you don't know everything um, and, and being willing and vulnerable enough to ask uh, someone who has very uh, close connection to the topic at hand what their connection to, to the, the topic might be. Okay, 
So her questions are as follows. Black Lives Matter. What's the difference between Black Lives Matter and Black Lives Are Important? It seems that people normally use quote unquote matter in a negative form, such as it does not matter. Question two, do you think the slogan sounds a, big, a bit separationist if someone does not know the background? For example, excuse me, some people scream, all lives matter and blue lives matter. Three, this is just my impression that the people who came up with this slogan are talking to fellow black people as in quote unquote, hey, black lives matter. I got you, I see you, quote, un unquote. Rather than telling the whole world, non-blacks, quote, hey, black lives matter, comma, motherfuckers, comma, you better treat our lives more seriously, exclamation mark, unquote. Could you comment on the meaning of this BLM slogan? Four, this is the probably the most salient question out of all of our questions, I think. Um, and this is gonna kind of connect to my next point that I'm gonna bring up. How do you think it would be best to translate Black Lives Matter? And then she has the Japanese characters um, after that. Black people's lives are important, question mark, or don't treat Black lives like shit, period. Don't treat Black lives without due respect, period. I understand that they mean as a slogan, the latter, but considering how this phrase is created, I am not sure if they are only demanding for non-Blacks and police to respect Black lives. I feel like the phrase also is assuring and telling fellow Black folks that Black lives are important. Could you comment on that? These are very deep diving questions. Okay, the next question. In Japanese, racism <clears throat> has been translated as racial discrimination. And now some people insist that we should translate it as race hyphen ism, just like communism and capitalism not including the nuance of discrimination. What do you think? Do you think the word racism means almost the same as white supremacy? And if we translate racism by emphasizing ism, do you think it may have a certain feeling that all races are separate but equal? And how would you describe racism as an English term? Next question, <laughs> I'm almost done. I think how Black people are called kind of has changed over the years. Right now, how should non-Blacks call you? Black, African-American, people of color? Last question, how would you define the phrase defund the police? I understand people interpret this phrase differently. And as I started to answer her questions, I realized that this is a very complex, complex topic because there is an organization called Black Lives Matter. And then there are people like me who are not affiliated with the organization, but the general concept behind the movement when it began, of course I'm for it. I'm Black and I want my life to matter as much as everyone else's. Um, so, there is a dichotomy within the, the movement and the term Black Lives Matter. So I wanted to explain that to her. And at the end of it all, I told her that if I could kind of paraphrase Black Lives Matter into a sentence, it would be Black Lives Matter just as much as everyone else's. So um, I'm not sure exactly how she ended up translating the phrase, but I just wanted to use that as an example of why it's important in the translation and interpretation profession to really partner with experts. If you know that there 
there's a topic that you're not an expert on, partner with somebody or relinquish the project um, if you don't feel that you can do an adequate job. Um, in some languages and lesser spoken languages, that's probably a little more difficult <clears throat> when there might not be a native level speaker in that language that has um, the connection or the understanding of the cultural topic in the source language. So in those cases in particular, it's tantamount that you bounce ideas off of native speakers who understand the topic very deeply. Um, I don't know how much time I have, Marilyn, but I have a, a few more anecdotes I'd like to share. Okay, well, you can share a couple and then we will yes, we'll move to the next speaker. Go ahead. Fantastic. So that leads to my next example of why <laughs> conferring with experts is really key. So the Hiroshima nuclear bombing tragedy, it is believed that it could have been averted, um, that it is partially in as a result of a mistranslation of the words of Prime Minister Suzuki. In response to the threat given by the US, China, and the UK of prompt and utter destruction, quote unquote, he, he was quoted as saying or translated as saying that he, that the threat was not worthy of comment. About one week later, the nuclear bombing occurred, killing over 200,000 people. However, it was stated that his actual comment meant something more like he refrained from comment at the moment. It may seem kind of similar, but the translation that was reported is much more emotionally charged than what his intention was. So this is really, really dangerous territory we are in when you don't have proper context, because as we know, languages are not the same. <laughs> certain phrases, certain concepts do not exist in um, every language. <clears throat> so there has to be a modulation to make the, the deeper meaning apparent to the target audience. And this was a big, big, a big error. And we have other examples. In the linguistic and language justice space, which is basically the concept that all people deserve to have access to an interpreter or a translator within the legal system. Um, and <clears throat> this is, I would say, looking at cultural competency from the opposite side of the spectrum, not where we're looking at the translator or the interpreter with contempt, but rather the infrastructure that hires them. So in language justice, there are several cases where judges have refused to provide interpreters for a defendant because many factors for in the case of the lesser spoken languages, it could be a question of budget. Excuse me. Lesser spoken languages because there are fewer qualified interpreters in those languages, they often charge a premium. And oftentimes, in, especially in the international the immigration court, they are not willing to pay those high fees for translators when they may have thousands of cases to try. So when this happens, the testimony of the defendant may never be heard. And in those cases, generally, they, they lose the case. Here's a specific example where an, an American judge refused to provide an interpreter for a defendant because it was assumed 
the defendant was pretending to be unable to speak standard English. When in fact, the defendant only spoke pidgin. It's a spoken language in several West African countries that is historically derived from English, but would not be fully understood or possibly understood at all by a native standard English speaker, and hence would require interpretation. Due to the language barrier, the defendant's case was not ruled in their favor, more than likely due to their testimony never being interpreted. Okay, so I would say this could be averted <laughs> if there would be more cultural sensitivity training on for all of the, the legal teams, the judges, the adjudicators. And there is an issue of a budget here. Um, what the priority is in terms of translation and interpretation and really starting to embrace more virtual options for translation and interpretation. Um, I think now because of the pandemic, it's kind of pushed us all into this microcosmic box where we're all connected. So with language services, and I'm sure Joseph can attest to this, that it has really increased access to uh, language service professionals. Whereas before you really wanted them to be there in person, you demanded them to be there in person, which would of course increase the price, but now everybody's at home. Uh, not so much with interpreters, I've noticed. They're still, they've been kind of face-to-face -face the, the entire pandemic, <clears throat> especially on the community interpreting side, but there's now technology that allows you to see the interpreter's face on a screen. Um, that, that is now being used for um, oral interpretation. It was used for decades for a, a American Sign Language, <coughs> excuse me, for American Sign Language interpreting. But now I'm seeing it being used in hospitals as well for Spanish and other languages. Okay, and my last anecdote would be the Gorman translation controversy. So I'm sure um, many of you saw the inauguration of President Biden and there was a young African-American <clears throat> poetess, um, Miss Gorman, who presented one of her original poems for the inauguration. And she became like a global star overnight. Um, for many different reasons, but because of that, many major publishers wanted to translate her works. Mühlenhof uh, was the publisher who was contracted to get her work translated into various European languages. There were two translators, one for Dutch and one for Catalan, who one of the translators uh, quit, and the other translator was fired after he had already translated the poem. And this was because of what I will call cancel culture, where online there was an uproar about both translators not being of the same profile as Ms. Gorman, um, female Afri of African descent, and being a poet. As a poet myself, there is really a creative and artistic advantage that a, a, a fellow poet would have in translating the work of another poet because we would be more attuned to the nuances that go into poetry, the rhyme, the feel, the rhythm, more so than just um, a general translator or even a literary translator, because poetry is very, very unique in that way that it's musical at times, especially spoken word styled poetry like uh, Miss Gorman's. So um, they 
Muhlenhoff also wanted to translate an entire collection of her poetry. <clears throat> and I think that's very important to state. The entire body of her work is very specific to her life and her being a Black woman that she references several times in her poetry. So um, I think if I could kind of give my opinion about the controversy, I don't think it was as much a critique of the caliber of work and the skill of the translators chosen. I think it was more a critique uh, or a raising of the question to whether a translator who more closely fit the profile of Gorman was even considered. Um, as we know, there are high numbers um, of underrepresentation of minorities, um, African American interpreters in the American TI profession, and we see uh, high numbers of underrepresentation in Europe of um, TI professionals of African descent. So there is that issue of not having a, a big enough selection of linguists to choose from. Um, but that also is something that really needs to be addressed. Why is that? Are there systemic issues that are limiting access uh, to um, interpreters and translators of color into the profession. Um, in the United States, we know that there are limited training opportunities. We have Monterey in California, and there are colleges kind of spread across that have certification programs, University of Maryland, College Park, um, and Howard, we have our courses. But we definitely need to have higher um, standards, uh, for uh, selecting quality interpreters, and we need to really recruit more for uh, more diverse, more diversity in the TI profession, and really encourage students at the high school level and the collegiate level to study abroad and to um, really consider the TI profession. So those are my thoughts. Thank you so much for your time. Now we will move on to the next uh, speaker. Thank you very much uh, to uh, uh, Professor Wesley. And we will now uh, uh, ask uh, Joseph Maza to introduce himself and to, uh, you know, the floor is his. We will reserve the applause for the end of the panel. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and thank you, Professor Wesley. I enjoyed listening to you immensely. I would love to have a long conversation over a cup of coffee with you sometime because you touched on so many areas of interest in my career. A brief introduction, my name is Joe Mazza and I run the translating division at the Office of Language Services at the United States Department of State, the foreign ministry of this country, the United States of America. So I'm working with the written language. I am not an interpreter by profession, although the interpreters for the State Department are our very close colleagues within the Office of Language Services. So my comments today will generally be about the use of written language, specifically the written language in service of diplomacy, which is the conduct of international relations, generally between sovereign states, but also within and among international organizations. Uh, in terms of my language background, I worked for years as a Russian translator and as a translator of Romance languages. And I've been in management for about 20 years now. I visit many, many languages on a daily basis, but no longer actively translate, except for an occasional foray into the Romance languages as a translator. Uh, I have 10 years of experience as a teacher of English as a second language at a community school in Adams Morgan. I stopped doing that a number of years ago, but right now I'm teaching Spanish translation at the University of Maryland at their graduate program in interpreting and translating. And some of the things that Professor Wesley mentioned really ring true for me, and uh, it's just inspiring to hear other learned folks uh, talk about the importance of culture in translation. The course I teach, it's a year-long course, 
in uh, various niches, uh, genres of translation. So there are 14 modules in that course, and you'll be interested because this will apply to any language that you might teach for, to the translator and perhaps to the interpreter as well. In those 14 modules, we visit a different type of text, a different genre. So it might be medical, it might be legal, it might be poetry, it might be prose. Before every examination of the text type, we talk about culture. So I'm lucky because I teach a course in, of, of Spanish translation and there are so many locales. There are so many countries where Spanish is spoken. Indeed, one of the biggest challenges for the Spanish translator is to maintain a, a fluency, not only in the language, but in the culture, as Professor Wesley was saying, of each of these locales. And it's hard. You may go through a period, say you study in Spain and you marry a Mexican. Okay, great. Spain and Mexico will probably always be a part of your life. But are you current on what's happening in Costa Rica? in Paraguay, in Equatorial Guinea. These are all places where Spanish is used as the official language by vast majority of the populace. It's hard to stay on top of more than 20 locales. We must always be training ourselves, always revisiting. We must be lifelong students, not always of language and culture. And I think we tend to focus as students on the cultures of our source language. I'm going to be a Spanish to English translator, therefore, I must learn thoroughly all 20, 22, 24 locales of Spanish. That in itself is huge. And you're right, you need to do that. What you need to do is be a really quick study. So if you haven't looked at Nicaragua in a year, you need to get up to speed in Nicaragua really quickly. It helps to have a broad education and so that you can sort of turbocharge that knowledge of Nicaragua. So you can dive in an editorial, you can dive into a sports article, you can dive into a speech, you can dive into anything from Nicaragua and begin to reacquaint yourself with the particular culture of Nicaragua within a broader uh, context of Spanish speaking countries. But I also think it's very important to not neglect your target language. Now for most of us here, Howard University is in Washington, D.C. For most of us, that means it's going to be English. But it's funny, we translators tend to neglect that sometimes, and you need to be a lifelong student of English too, and work on your composition skills in English, your usage, your style, your knowledge of the locale, because you're always going to be writing for people who speak English, who don't have the benefit of all of your knowledge of the Spanish speaking world. You're going to have to convey it to them. So if you say someone is a campesino in Nicaragua, are you going to say that they're a campesino? Are you going to say they're a peasant? Are you going to say they're a farmer? Are you going to say they're a landless farmer? Are you going to say they're a sharecropper? All of these will bring in enormous baggage from the United States experience. And then what if people who, whose native language is English are reading it from Australia or Wales or Botswana? They'll bring in their baggage too, which you may not have even thought of. So you need to think of English as a multi-locale language as well. Otherwise you risk only appealing to audiences in the United States. And look what Professor Wesley was saying, look at the diversity within the United States of English speakers. You see it all mixes around and your only survival tool is going to be learning many locales. So what is this man saying? Is he saying I need to know 22 to 24 locales of Spanish and their culture? I need to know 22 to 24 locales of English and their culture? Yes, you do and you gotta be a pretty quick study to do it. But there's more. You need to know all the other cultures of the world too. You need to know the cultures of all the countries of Europe, the Middle East, Sub-Saharan Africa, the Indian subcontinent, the Far East, Oceania. Do you know what's going on in Vanuatu right now, in Oceania? Do you know what's going on in Cabo Verde, in West Africa? Do you know what's going on in Grenada, in the Caribbean? What's happening in Manitoba, in Canada? How about Greenland, the Faroe Islands, Slovakia? You're saying, but I'm a Spanish to English translator. Why do I need to know these things? Well, you need to know them for two reasons. The article you're translating from Spanish to English may be about Slovak politics. Maybe it's Madrid's point of view on what's happening in Bratislava. So Slovakia becomes very important all of a sudden, but I've never studied Slovakia before. Well. Visit all the countries of the world. Think of the world as your house. Visit every room in that house. 
Some you'll stay in others. You know, like, I love my rec room. Don't love my attic so much. Don't love my junk room so much. I don't go there too much, right? Okay. But you should go to them sometimes. You should learn all of these cultures. A little bit goes a long way. Um, you also need to know the perceptions. You need to know the, the richness of these cultures in order to shape your English composition. Um, you'll get ideas by reading Chinese history, by reading Indian history, by reading about Southeast Asian religions, by reading about food ways in Korea, for example. You will learn things that will inform. They will challenge your notions. They will challenge your assumptions. They'll bust them. And that's extremely important. Um, will it complicate your task as you try? Yes, it will. Um, you know, uh, ignorance is bliss, right? If you only have one way of looking at something, you're like, um, oh, manzana, apple. <laughs> that's a no-brainer. I don't need to look that up. But, you know, um, Eve ate the apple. We all, we all know that if we grow up in, a, in an Abrahamic tradition, we know that Eve gave a piece of fruit to Adam in the Garden of Eden. Now, the Bible, most translations just call it fruit, but somehow this idea that it's an apple crept in, whether from artists or from folklore. Well, the word used in the Bible is peri in, in biblical Hebrew, and it's not clear what a peri really is. It definitely seems to be some kind of fruit, but is it a fig? Is it an apple? Is it a grape? Is it a date? Is it a kumquat? Everybody argues about this, right? Um, but you need to know all the possibilities so that you can render things correctly. And I only have a little bit more time, but just to talk a little bit about diplomatic translation. I mean, there's something right there. We talk about, wow, you're a born diplomat. And what does that mean? Does it mean you're tactful, you're sensitive, you negotiate? Does it have a negative connotation? Are you a wheeler dealer? Are you concealing something? Well, it has all of those things when you say it in English, right? But if we go back to the source, diploma in Greek, what is a diploma? It's modern day. We think of it as an academic record, correct? But in ancient times, it was simply a folded document. It goes back to an old Indo-European duo, which is our word too. It's, it's, it's as simple as that. Um, that's the etymology of the word diploma, which gives us diplomat. And it's important to know this history of why do we have diplomatic translations? We have diplomatic translations because at some point in activity, in antiquity, um, there were two states, political units. You need a state, the political unit of the state. You need that to happen. You need the people to come together in an organized structure, whether they're an agricultural community or a hunter-gatherer community. They've got to come together in some organized structure and have a state. You need two languages. And if we're talking about diplomatic translations, those languages have to be written. So that takes a while in human experience before we start writing down languages. And we see that happening in Mesopotamia, but that's only one place. And the third thing, and that really hits to the heart of diplomacy, you need a sense of parity. Imagine ancient peoples encountering one another. A lot of those encounters were violent and they involved, and involved some type of obliteration, either of human lives or of culture. The vanquished had to submit spiritually, economically, and in every way to the victor. Only when nations began to see each other as equals, or semi-equals at least, could you have diplomacy because it wasn't merely conquest. It was, okay, we've had a conflict. Let's talk about this. Let's write down a piece of paper what we're going to do about it. You need some level of respect to get that piece of paper written and then to uphold it, to actually defend it. And this we see also happening in Mesopotamia in antiquity. But what's been very interesting for me is to try to break out of this sort of Mediterranean basin Eurocentric um, view of diplomacy, of diplomatic language, of diplomatic terminology, and look at state systems in other parts of the world, um, in Ethiopia, which is an ancient, ancient state, uh, in the South Seas, for example, and also in, in, in East Asia, which has an ancient and rich tradition of, of diplomacy. You see, the European system began to overtake the rest of the world. We all know why, familiar reasons, in the 17th, 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. And so languages like French and English became very important in diplomacy and tended to edge out, if not words, then usages, right? So our modern diplomatic system is very much a product of 19th and 20th century European experience. 
Um, indeed, a word like diplomacy, even in a rich language, ancient language like Arabic, it's a diplomacia. It's it, they borrow the word, and it's, which isn't to say they didn't have other words to explain the concept, but the everyday common word winds up being a European word, a Greek word. Well, it's right across the Mediterranean. There's no reason why not they, they, they can't do that. But it's always interesting to see when concepts that are deeply rooted in an area are maintained and can actually work their way into this international system. And since my time is running out, just to say that uh, I invite you on this fascinating journey of diplomatic translation. It's rich because it involves really any topic in the world. It's rich because it involves so many languages, uh, tends to be the official languages of a country, not the regional languages of a country, but potentially can involve anything. And it's a great time to get involved because technology is revolutionizing how we work. We're using computer assisted translation. We're using multilingual desktop publishing. We're using machine translation. We're looking at all the ways this can work. So after you're finished studying every single culture of the world in every single locale, you can study about 15 platforms of technology and um, your head will be dizzy, but you will have an extremely rewarding professional and intellectual life. Thank you so much. So now uh, Professor Jenkins is going to fill the, the questions and uh, ask uh, the students whether, or the public in general uh, whether they have questions. We also have a Q&A that where you can post your question. morning. I was not able to share my video, so I was just kind of sitting here in silence. But uh, I really appreciate both uh, Professor Wesley and Mr. Joseph um, uh, with their uh, topics that they shared. I just wanted to introduce myself. I am Professor Jenkins. I work at Howard University, um, and I teach simultaneous interpretation with Dr. Safokle. I also teach the basic level courses and currently am teaching uh, oral communication this semester and we are having a blast in that class. But I just wanted to <laughs> touch on a couple of things that um, both Kenny and uh, Mr. Joseph said, and it was basically talking about languages and acquainting ourselves with the news around the world. So one of the things we focus on specifically in simultaneous interpretation is the current news, what's going on, making sure that you are staying up to date with things around the world. Because as what was stated earlier is, um, you know, the languages are constantly changing and you can't keep up with them if you don't know what's going on outside of just your immediate circle. So not only is Spanish language changing, English is changing as well, which was also said earlier. So it's not enough just to keep up with what is going on in your circle and outside of the world, but mainly because one of my focuses and passions is um, idiomatic expressions. I love idiomatic expressions. And they are the hardest thing to interpret and translate around the world, especially if you don't, aren't, or if you're unaware culturally. And so one of the focuses in one of the classes is trying to translate, for example, the speech that was given by um, Ms. Gorham and for the, uh, President Biden. And trying to translate that accurately without it losing its meaning. And that's really essentially what happens when you're interpreting across languages. So it's really, really interesting. I want to thank Dr. Sofocle um, for putting on this conference every year. I always enjoy it. Um, but as of now, I'm going to look and I don't see any questions in the chat. So do any of you guys have questions for either um, Professor Wesley or Mr. Joseph um, that we can, okay, here's one popping up right now. Uh, will translators approach languages that are oral versus written differently? Is that, I don't know if that is to someone specifically, but if either one of you guys want to answer that, that'd be great. Well, I, I can jump in if you'd like, cool. but I'll give um, a, a moment or two also to Professor Wesley. Um, Obviously, translation, we tend to think of a written language, but I can think of a, of a situation where you might have a language that is seldom uh, reduced to writing. Notice that phrase, reduced, as if it's something bad, right? <laughs> it's richer when it's spoken. But imagine, well, for example, um, Professor Wesley talked about certain pigeons or creoles or patois. These are not often written. Sometimes they are. Haitian creole is official 
in the Republic of Haiti, but in some places they're not. And there's no reason why they shouldn't be, but it's just for whatever circumstance, they're not often written. And if they are, sometimes there's a lack of standardization. There's not an academy of the language banging the gavel saying, you have to spell this beautiful word this way or else it's wrong. Okay, fine. So there are those languages out in the world. And maybe you would talk maybe about a Surinamese Creole. And somebody comes to the United States and they make a statement in this Surinamese Creole that may be written, may not be written. And you have to translate it now. Um, so you listen to the tape, you transcribe it, first of all, you reduce it to writing. It's important to do that. And maybe you're using your own idiosyncratic spelling conventions, fine. And now you must translate it. Is that different than me doing that for a well-documented language like Spanish or Vietnamese? Well, I would think it is. In some senses, you're a bit freer because you don't have to worry so much about the spelling of the other language. Um, but in other senses, your resources are going to be very limited. You're probably not going to find tons and tons of material online from which to draw your research. You're probably gonna have to rely on a lot more um, folks around you who know the language, but if you're doing this for law enforcement, for example, that can be a little difficult because your community in the United States may be extremely small and you may not wanna be saying that I'm doing this thing in Surinamese, Surinamese um, Creole and they're gonna say, oh, who are you listening to? Because you know, I think you're listening to my brother-in-law and it gets very gossipy and possibly dangerous. So those are just a few of my initial impressions as to why that would be a particularly challenging but actually super fun and you might even be part of the process of sort of codifying a language that hasn't traditionally been written that much. I'm a Sicilian American and you know Sicilian used to be the prestige dialect of Italian until the Tuscans took that honor away from us in the Middle Ages and we've never been the prestige dialect again. So the rules for writing Sicilian are pretty up in the air. There's probably some academy in Palermo that says they're policing it but um, it's really fun to deal with Sicilian because it has a richness of vibrancy. You almost feel a bit freer somehow, but you have to be careful because you always need to be accurate as a translator. Okay, Professor Wesley, did you wanna add anything? Uh, it's funny that he mentioned the example of pitches because that was gonna be the example I brought up, but I, mm -hmm. I totally agree with all of the points he made. And also I would say that this is more reason for an increased amount of diversity in the profession because when we look at <clears throat> the history of many languages becoming written languages, it was because of um, translators. Some of the missionaries who were going to different countries um, translating the Bible into uh, local dialects and languages is sometimes the very first written example of some of these lesser spoken languages. So as we increase representation in the profession, that will also help increase the amount of standard writing standards for all of these lesser spoken languages, if you will. So yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a really interesting topic. Great question. Okay, thank you. We're gonna move on to our next question, which is what is the impact of disappearing languages on diplomacy in other words, when a language dies, is it missed? <laughs> this is a wonderful question. Um, I'll jump in and then I'll hand it off to Professor Wesley. I mean, any one of these could be a senior seminar at a university, any of these questions, right? It's not fair. <laughs> well, I miss any language, right? If I know the language existed and it's not spoken anymore, I miss it. So let's talk about Cornish, a Celtic language of Cornwall in England. If you look at geography, you see these people were sort of pressed up against the Atlantic Ocean by the rising tide of the Germanic English language to the point where in the 18th century, Dolly Pentreath was a fisherman's wife who was the last speaker. And that's a pretty sad thing to be because you can't speak to anybody else. But apparently she would sit in the pub and she would curse at passersby in her beautiful, vivid, earthy Cornish. And probably people knew the bad words, right? Those are always the last to go, right? The food words and the bad words are the last I think to go. That's something I would do if I was the last person to know a language. <laughs> the last person, right? And um, 
but you know, Cornish didn't die because people revive it. The great thing is there are revivals and enough was written, enough was kept. And you'll find that there are people in Cornwall who use it. I don't know if it enjoys any type of protected status, any official status in local affairs, but I'm sure you're gonna find websites in it and Bible translations and groups of people who get together and try to use it. Look at the revival of Hebrew as a living language, right? Is anything missed? Well, as long as there are people who care about language, I think it's the wrong question for this environment because I think we all love language, right? And so we all will miss it. Um, Professor Wesley. What a deep question, wow. I, I was an exchange student in the Francophone section of Switzerland after high school. And while I was there, we were at a dinner one night at my host parents, parents house in the countryside. And after everyone ate dinner, they began singing in this strange language <laughs> that I had no idea what it was. And it actually was my first time out of the country, my first time really hearing different languages and being around non-American people. So I was really a fish out of water. So everything was new and fret refreshing to me. And I was asking them, this is not French. What language is this? <laughs> and they explained to me that it's what they call Patois. It was mm -hmm. one of the original languages spoken in that region of Switzerland at the time, and it's now extinct. And the only way that it has survived is through these old songs. And it just really warmed my heart to know that there's so much uh, culture and history lingering through the arts and through these random uh, happenstances that you wouldn't necessarily connect uh, with language and history. But uh, so I think disappearing languages, although they might disappear, the legacy will still be in the canon, fortunately, because we have digitalization, we have recording software now, so we can really um, canonize a lot of these things that otherwise would be gone. And there's there are even professionals who study this languages that have been extinct. And I, I don't know <laughs> what they get out of that other than helping to preserve the legacy of those languages. But it's definitely a field that is being studied and they're experts in this. And I, I will just interject here to say that we are 61 people on this uh, on this particular uh, uh, presentation. So uh, if you could, uh, when you ask your question, could you please mention which country you are from uh, and your uh, institution so that we can highlight the uh, different countries and different institutions that are participating. Thanks. Okay, so I do have one in the question and answer, and then I also see someone type something in the chat. So I'll get to that one after this one. But to piggyback off of the mention of Patois, this question actually mentions it. How does the panel view Jamaican Patois in terms of it being a bona fide course at a university like Howard University? I'm gonna yield to Professor Wesley since it, it's your school, sir. <laughs> Well, actually, I have been very intrigued with um, Jamaican Patois, that variety of Patois. Um, the uh, French Romand Patois that I was referring to is more closely connected to Latin, um, but <clears throat> there are multiple Patois. So basically a Patois is it has different meanings in different languages. So in the context of um, Switzerland, it just means an, an older language. But in our world, in the Western world, when we say Patois, we're referring to a language that is kind of a mixture of different languages that was created for trade purposes during the transatlantic slave trade. In the Jamaican context, we see similarities between the Jamaican variety of Patois and the language spoken in the Gullah Islands, which is a chain of, um, which is a location starting at Wilmington, North Carolina, which is near my hometown, <laughs> going all the way down South Carolina's coast, all the way to the northern tip of Georgia. And these languages have been connected to Sierra Leone the grammatical structure, the vocabulary, and there are some texts 
um, of the Sierra Leone variety of this um, language <clears throat> that were written centuries ago. And what happened uh, when I was in, I think, graduate school, one of my colleagues from Jamaica, she was reading this text and she says, I understand this. This is like Jamaican Patois. And it was a Sierra Leone uh, text. So um, absolutely, I think it's, it's, it, it is a language um, because there's a culture, there's a history, there's a grammatical structure. When I hear people speak Patois, especially when they get deep into the, um, the nuances of it, I don't understand it. And as an English speaker, I say that proudly. I, I don't, I think sometimes people, they feel that they need to assert that they understand things that are kind of connected to English, but I gladly will say, no, I don't understand. <laughs> sometimes when I hear Brits speak, I don't understand. <laughs> what they're saying. But um, so yes, I think it merits further analysis. And I would put it in the category of the West African pigeons as well, that there's just not a lot of scholarship on these languages. And there has been a um, hesitancy to standardize these languages for many reasons, because there are many countries that speak uh, the West African variety of pidgin and there are several different versions of it. So how do you standardize it? Who decides to standardize it? Um, it, it literally goes right back to my um, initial premise that we need to increase diversity in the profession. So these um, lesser spoken languages or less uh, standardized languages can start to begin to be included in the international conversation. I was just going to say, this is another question. This is the wrong crowd because we all love languages. So not only do I think it should be the object of serious study, I want to sign up for the course because it would be a great course to take. And I think you can do so much with the knowledge of it. And yes, maybe Jamaica and Jamaican culture is not going to be a key part of your professional or personal life for the rest of your life. But the skills that you learn in studying any language, Patois, Creole, Pidgin, any kind of language, are transferable. They'll give you another window. And I think that's why we're sad when languages die, because the window closes, right? And some unique thing is lost and we try to revive it. What I wanted to say though, as, as Professor Wesley was talking, I thought of the need to respect code switching. And yes, you should absolutely study a Patois or a Creole, or I hate to use the word dialect because it is so misused, but I'll use it because we don't have much time. Yes, all objects of intent, uh, uh, worthy objects of study, very much so but also objects of respect. And um, that means you have to respect them so much, you have to know when to use them. And that's respect for the people who have that culture. Respect for a Jamaican, for example, would dictate that if you're not in the group, you pull out your amazing knowledge of Jamaican Patois in a way that shows respect and that's one of the hardest things to teach and we all know that right say we study abroad i'll just pick peru we learn peruvian culture inside and out we go out drinking with uh, our buddies we learn how to crack jokes we learn the soccer teams the pop stars we're just living the life right well we're living the life in maybe upper middle class urban Peru, we're not living the life of Quechua speakers outside of Cusco, but in our little locale, we're doing really well. Fast forward five years later, we meet a Peruvian diplomat at a conference. Are we gonna say, Oi, vamos a chupar bien rico este viernes. Right? We're gonna knock a few back this Friday. Am I gonna do that to show this guy, hey, I'm so solid with you, I totally get your world, right? And what is he gonna say? Bueno, a lo mejor. Yeah, maybe. And he's probably going to do the body language, right? That's the gesture question I'm getting to, right? He's going to sort of recoil a little bit. And maybe he will be out there chupando bien rico el viernes con sus compinches. Maybe. Maybe he doesn't drink. But I've intruded into his cultural space now. I've been presumptuous. And so my amazing knowledge, maybe I learned this at a great course or studying abroad, my amazing knowledge has now defeated me. 
because I'm too eager. And we do this, right? We're so happy. We have it. We want to share it. We want to perfect it. I want to show you I get your world, right? Hey, I've lived in D.C. for 40 years, and I choose to live in downtown D.C. a few blocks from Howard because I like having other cultures in my life. And if there's one thing I've learned with age, it's use your knowledge carefully, right? I love all the cultures of all my neighbors. But when I walk into their houses, I will be my primary self until I'm given leave to be something else. And even then, I will stray very little outside my primary self unless I get really comfortable with the person. And it's about respect. Enough okay. said. Thank you. Um, I wanted to touch on the fact that, that last question you guys answered is from, and please excuse me if I pronounce your name wrong, Dr. Jean Prashas Tulak, who says that they are a bona fide Jamaican, just so that you guys know that. All right, we are touching on our last question because our next line of panelists is ready and ready to go. So they would like, who is this from? Um, question is from Val Okru, a CEO general counsel of Afro Cosmo Development Impact USA. And they just wanted you guys to touch on or comment on the power of language and gestures in facilitating cooperation in global contract negotiations. The late mm -hmm. Roger Fisher's Harvard University negotiations professor book, Getting to Yes, referenced how language and culture can create conflict or enhance understanding in international diplomacy. So I'll leave that to you guys to comment on. <laughs> Professor Wesley, would you like to go first? Okay, so this is a very great question. Uh, the role of the interpreter, um, I think this is more of an interpreting question perhaps, uh, is not just of transferring the information from one language to another, but it's also to um, transfer the culture and to be somewhat of a cultural advocate um, or informant of the people they're working for. For example, if there is a custom of shaking hands that uh, doesn't exist in another culture, you wouldn't want to extend your hand to them, things of that nature. So that goes back to Joseph's point about really studying the cultures, studying the history, studying the customs, because it could mean a, an, an issue of getting the deal or not. <laughs> um, I, I totally think that that is um, equally as important as the language. And I would hope that language programs start to really teach about the, the nuances of the culture and the customs just as much as the language and the grammar aspect of it. Um, absolutely, to just segue off of what Professor Wesley said, um, you live in DC, you, make great Ethiopian food. You start the first chain of Ethiopian restaurants in DC. And everybody loves it. And you notice that people who are not Ethiopians are really loving it. They're coming in droves. So you decide that you're going to take your show on the road and you're going to break into the market in, oh, I don't know, Seoul, the capital of South Korea. I assume you've done your market research and you think this will work. So you're going to start negotiating your first deals to lease a few places and maybe deal with the health authorities and deal with some ad agencies and translators. Um, who do you want to work on this with you? Do you want somebody who is absolutely fluent in Korean? Um, do you want somebody who understands Korean culture? Um, what if you're a woman and you're the head of this company and you're going to go to Korea and maybe everybody you're working with is a man? Is that gonna cause some challenges? Um, the more you know about the culture, the better. And do you have that respect, right? So that you're going to not put all your cards on the table about your awesome knowledge of everything Korean. Do you have enough knowledge to know how to behave in different situations? What's appropriate? Um, I would want somebody who knows all those things. I would say I would have the best, the best um, possible advice. And I might even want somebody to say, hey, um, Joe, Love your Ethiopian food. We go every Friday. We get takeout. It's amazing. Have you really considered your market research, though? Do you really think that Seoul is ready for Ethiopian food? 
why don't you try this other place? I would like that kind of information. I think all of you would. So I hope that that answers your question. Every question has been so incredibly vast. I'm really impressed with the questions. Okay, great. I want to thank you both for answering the questions. And Dr. Spokley, I'll go ahead and turn it to you to shift on to our next uh, set of panelists. So first of all, I would like to have a big applause for the panelists. Thank you very much for your very valuable insight in uh, this conversation. I think we could go on and on forever.